Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel. And this week, I want you to meet Julia Hart, co-founder and CEO of Eventbrite, a global self-service ticketing platform for live experiences that allows anyone to create, share, and find and attend events that fuel their passions and enrich their lives. Julia co-founded the company in 2006 on a mission to bring the world together through live experiences. Under her leadership, Eventbrite has grown to serve a community of nearly 1 million event creators around the world. Julia brought the company public in 2018, and last year alone, 367,000 event organizers generated $3.3 billion in gross ticket sales from 1.7 million paid events on the platform. She's been honored as one of Inc.'s Female Founders 100, Fortune's 40 Under 40 Business Leaders, Inc.'s 35 Under 35, and Fortune's Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs. And with that, let's welcome Julia. Julia, first of all, let's go back to that 2006 moment. How did Event Break get off the, the, the ground? And tell us a little bit about that origin story that maybe people don't know as well. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, God, that seems so long ago now, but I think there's something so special about the 2005 to 2007 vintage companies. I find that, you know, we've really seen some stuff uh, and so I'm really proud to be a part of that vintage. I think that, you know, when we first started Eventbrite, it was really three co-founders coming together with very different points of view. Uh, Kevin, my co-founder, husband, the previous CEO of Eventbrite, now the chairman. There's a lot wrapped in there. He (laughs) was really passionate about scaling platforms that enabled anyone to do something that they couldn't do before without the advent of technology and specifically, you know, merchant processing enablement that companies like PayPal had brought to market where all of a sudden everyone was a merchant. You know, you democratized the movement of money. And so he was really coming to Eventbrite with a passion around that, having founded a company called Zoom, X-O-O-M, that helped immigrants transfer money across border better, faster, cheaper than Western Union. And so that was his point of view. That was his origin story. My origin story was I had worked in television development and I had witnessed firsthand the just incredible energy that exists in live experiences that you can't easily replicate through digital entertainment. And then third, Renault came to our little band of misfits uh, as our founding CTO. And Renault is an incredible photographer. So his side hustle has been, I mean, he's really world renowned in photography, but he had a passion around helping people pursue their passions and turn passion into profit. So it really was an amalgamation of all the things that we had experienced up to that point. And then what we saw as a unifying vision around Eventbrite, which could be a way to bring the world together through live experiences by enabling anyone to be able to create any kind of event anywhere in the world and succeed. Can we go back to the beginning? The fact that you could actually charge online now was a big breakthrough and bringing people together. You know, there's Ticketmaster for big things, but there's nothing for this. How did you get this wheel in motion? There were the things that we would have traditionally done in 2006 as a startup that we really kind of denied. We, we cut our own path. And then there's the advent of new technologies, which is so relevant today that really acted as a tailwind. We did a few things that uh, traditionally you wouldn't do in creating a platform like Eventbrite. We did not focus vertically. We wanted to really focus on being the platform where any event could possibly exist and we could power any kind of creator. So effectively really walking the walk of democratization where most companies We'll focus on a category or a specific geo and really focus on getting their um, flywheel in motion. We really focused on breadth. The second thing we did was we focused on self-service. We wanted Eventbrite to be as easy as setting up a Gmail account. That was our going in inspiration of the product experience. And that was really different in the good old days. 
you couldn't actually find a ticketing solution that you didn't have to, you know, pick up the phone and call or sign a contract or spend lots of money to install. So making it friction free to set up an event and really focusing on making that possible in under a minute was the North Star for our product experience starting out. And I would say the third thing that we did that was against the grain is that we started the company together and we were engaged. Uh, So, you know, at the time that wasn't very popular. What that did was it allowed us to have the broadest surface area possible. We started with this notion of micropayment transaction processing and the creator as the democratized merchant. We were the first to use the events API at Facebook. The more people were creating any kind of content, the more they were sharing that, the more that they were sending traffic from Facebook to Eventbrite. Facebook took notice. Uh, They gave us the events API key to see what we could do. We took advantage of that and grabbed that. That was another inflection point of growth. We also realized that creating event listings is a user-generated page of content. So we made that incredibly crawlable and searchable. So our search engine optimization started to fuel the growth of the company. You know, the advent of mobile as a place to find events and to store your tickets. It was big data and the ability to connect dots and find consumers that might want to attend your event. We really allowed ourselves to be open. Um, We didn't take a very narrow point of view at first. We did one thing, I think, exceptionally well, which is we became absolute cyber stalkers of our customers. We followed their every move to understand how we can make what they were already doing better, faster, and more effective. So that really helped us, and to this day, guides our jobs to be done framework. And we didn't try to make them do something they weren't doing. We really focused on making them better at what they did. And that just allowed us to adopt these new advancing technologies and create that flywheel over time. What tips do you have for other founders that are listening on, you can focus on so many things, it can actually be overwhelming. Define what that means to focus on the core customer. Well, you know, our core customer for the, for the you know, 15 years that we've been working on Eventbrite has been the event creator. And it's event creators, producers, organizers, promoters, hosts, they're very different people. And they don't typically think of themselves as an event creator. That's sort of a very like broad term that we brush over it. They're coming at creating a gathering from a different perspective. It could be that they want to create awareness for an issue. They want to celebrate a milestone. They want to create lead gen for their company. They are building an events company that's based on gathering. They're using events as a marketing tool. So it's really hard to draw sort of uh, one common thread But for our creator community, the one common thread is that they are passionate about bringing people together through live experiences. And so, yes, in the early days, I was the customer support department, the marketing department, and the finance department. And if I had to point out some of the differences that I see in today's startup world, we've lost a little bit of that scrappiness. I think that there's been a glorification of being a founder to the point that founders start out with a bunch of money and they start to hire people right away and they really lose touch fast with what's happening in the core nucleus of their company. So Kevin and I quite literally had the phone numbers of our customers and they have our phone number and we still talk from time to time. There's nothing better than when a a customer from 2006 calls you. (laughs) I mean, it is incredible. But that was our way of figuring out what to build. We spent less than a quarter of a million dollars bootstrapping Eventbrite with our own money in two years and got to traction. We got to product market fit. I think that what that did for us is it ingrained the creator as the nucleus. During the pandemic, talk about what you learned. Give us like a play-by-play of those many years. What did you guys learn? What did that feel like? Give us a sense of what, you know, you clearly muscled through and now things are going swimmingly all over again. But tell us what that was like for you. Well, we were coming off of a pretty tough 2019. The backstory is that we had gone public in 2018. We were integrating a big acquisition. We were spinning a lot of plates on trying sort of new, interesting ideas for the business. 
and we are spreading ourselves way too thin. So coming into 2020, we had a plan that really essentially a self-imposed reckoning on focus. So getting back to that theme of focus, this was one of those things where we can no longer do everything all at once. We really needed to start honing in on what was most important. And so as we went into the year, we had this focus plan. We had an incredible first quarter. And toward the end of February, we had a board meeting. And we have an incredible board, very lucky. Two directors in particular had close business ties with Asia. And they were really freaked out. And I'll never forget that I said, and I'm sure they won't either, that I said at the board meeting, let's not make this whole board meeting about coronavirus. We parted ways after the board meeting and our team went and prepared this sort of disaster plan that, you know, we would really use if coronavirus became a thing and impacted our business. I would say maybe less than two weeks later, at the beginning of March, I received a text at 5 a.m. from my CFO and it just said, it's here. And I rolled over in bed I logged into Tableau and I looked at our previous day's revenue. And, you know, Eventbrite is one of those just machines that keeps growing and growing. And so the line marches up to the right on Tableau and then there's just a little kink in that previous day. Oh, no. And it was like ice water going through my veins. And I jumped up and I grabbed, did what any person in a crisis would do is I grabbed a whiteboard and I started just mapping out the things that we needed to do. And it became very instinctual. There was a, there's a maternal instinct that I drew on big time during that chapter, because from that day to over the course of the next two weeks, most gatherings were mandated by the CDC as practically unlawful. And the restrictions on gatherings came like waves just over and over and over again, kind of like, (laughs) kind of like contractions. And it was just of total freefall. Our revenue fell from that day down past the line of zero on Tableau, which broke the whole dashboard because we were processing more refunds than revenue. Thankfully, everyone was available at that moment in time. I would walk into our home office and Kevin would be on with some incredible luminary getting advice. I remember that um, Bob Mylod from Booking said, strap in kid, you're about to see negative revenue. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But he had been running booking during 9-11. So he knew exactly what was about to happen when everything comes to a grounding halt. It was just really intense. And I just got really laser focused on what did we need to do to survive? We needed to help our creators, help save the company. And we needed to support our employees who we call Brightlings. And those were my three main work streams. And all together, it was 90 days. But within the first 30 days, we had shrunk the company in half, achieved financing of the company to allow that, you know, for us to have a nice runway of getting through the disaster. By the summer of 2020, we were already rebuilding with our customers. Give us just one or two things that you just really learned about yourselves and that that you can pay for to anybody else going through a true crisis. First thing I learned is if you really care about something, there's no shame in it being analogous to, to other things that you really care about. Meaning I feel that Eventbrite is our first born in a way. And because of that, that maternal instinct, I think, was really about caring so much for the company and the people and our customers that I was going to do anything to make sure that the company survived this moment. There was nothing that was going to stop me. And we, Kevin and I, were just side by side with about 50 people virtually working to save the company. So I think like drawing on that and in a way, you know, I, I never called the Ventbrite a family. I've never, I've never really referenced it as my firstborn internally because I always thought that was kind of strange. But actually, that maternal instinct is something that I think really helped me get through and and be resolute about where we were going to end up. The second thing is that I had to move faster than I've ever moved before. And I find that I'm pretty fast and I love velocity. But it's, when you're in a crisis, it's warp speed. It, within 10 days, rewritten our strategy for what we would do if we could do it all over again, and then restructured the company to that and raised money, 
we were done in 30 days. This was not something that languished or we didn't wait and see. When you have the instinct of, of near and present danger, move fast. Let your flight and fight uh, really activate instead of letting any sort of rationalization or some voice of doubt come in because you'll never, ever be bummed that you did that. And in fact, when we were talking to to partners around financing, they thought some of our charts were way too negative in terms of recovery because people hadn't really grokked how big this would be. And there was a benefit of being the tip of the spear because we could see how bad it was going to be. And then the third thing is that I think that for me, what I learned about myself is that I had been doubting myself as CEO. It's not easy to be sharing a bed with the previous CEO and always be asking yourself, would they have done something better? (laughs) So I was not impervious to that. I think Kevin and I have been co-founders and co-parents and partners for a long time. So we have some really good coping mechanisms. But in the back of my head, I'd always been asking myself since I'd taken over as CEO in 2016, I'd been asking myself, what would Kevin do? And I really got to work with him closely on this crisis. And what happened for me is that I just left those tapes behind because I knew that I could lead through this crisis. I was so grateful to be supported by him and many others, but I was leading. And so what happened for me is it just turned off that whole reel of that ankle biting confidence, you know, eroding negative talk. And that's helped me tremendously over the last few years. You and Kevin and your third co-founder built the company really at the beginning of a recession, right? At the time, 2008 was the worst recession in 81 years. Obviously, COVID was worse for you. But what do you think that that did to the DNA of the business? Pay it forward to all the entrepreneurs that are out there that are in the early days of what you and I learned from being recession entrepreneurs. I highly recommend it. I have thought that the last cycle of of boom has been so bizarre. And, you know, it's not about raising your million dollar seed. It's about building something that people want, getting jobs done that people need done, that they want to, to invite you into their lives to help solve their problems, thinking about ways to reach product market fit without the need of capital. I mean, the obviously I'm very biased, but look across the cohort of companies that were founded between 2005 and 2007. There's some epic companies built during that time. There's a reason. I think the best companies are built during times of scarcity because there's not as much margin for error. At the same time, there's an immense amount of freedom and creativity. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Julia, I want to transition to you. Can we go back and think about your parents and your your upbringing? Was there something that your parents did that you loved so much that you were doing for your two kids today? I think of two things. So the first is that my parents got divorced when I was two. I never remembered our, our sort of nuclear family together as it originally was. And I have a brother who's five years older who I'm really close with. My parents did the most exceptional job of stacking hands and deciding that they were going to be amazing co-parents and best friends. I think that made all the difference in the world. I'm just now realizing the number of decisions that they would have had to make to make that work. So in fact, I grew up in Santa Cruz with three full-time parents, my mom, my dad, and my stepdad, and they were a united front. And now as I have some friends who are going through this or considering making a life change, I try to tell that story because I do think that there's an opportunity to turn it into something really beautiful. The second thing is that working hard is a virtue in our family and it's a value that we really uphold and commit to. Not achievement, not competitiveness, but working hard doing the work. They never pushed us in the way that you think about, you know, maybe adults pushing their children these days around sports, but yet they always instilled in us that they were proud of us for working hard. One of the facts I love about you that I know people know about, but I giggled um, when I learned it, which is that your first job was on the set of the TV show Friends. How did you go from Friends to Eventbrite? Well, my first job was actually at a coffee shop called The Ugly Mug in uh, Santa Cruz. My first college internship was on the set of Friends, and it was 
So bizarre. I went to Pepperdine University, which uh, is a small liberal arts college in Malibu. <laughs> the, the view does not suck. Or uh, <laughs> and uh, but because we were so small, we were sort of picked out in terms of internships because there were like big piles of of people from UCLA, big pile from USC, and then like tiny pile from Pepperdine. So I knew I wanted to be in television. I thought I was really trying to find myself. And basically I instinctually knew that I wouldn't figure out what I wanted to do by going to class. I'd have to do it hands-on. And I love to learn by doing, which is why I think I ended up succeeding at building a company or really loving it. Um, So I wanted to just get job experience. Now I was working two jobs to pay for college. And so I moved my all my classes to nighttime classes, which was possible at Pepperdine, which was pretty awesome. And I just, I worked and I interned during the day, starting the second semester of freshman year. And when I walked into that office on the lot, on the Warner Brothers lot, it was just surreal. It was just the most surreal thing. And the the interview was not typical. It was just a very bizarre experience. And my job essentially was to answer the set phone when it rang on the set of Friends during the height of the popularity of the show. And basically, I realized that anyone who had the set phone for Friends during that time, they were not very patient people. And truly, this created (laughs) a lifelong phobia of speaking on the phone. I'm not kidding. It was just about the worst job I ever had in my life because it was just so anxiety-provoking. I walked out of that, that internship going, okay, I don't think I want to be in production. Let me go try something else. And I just did a series of internships to basically (laughs) deduce what I wanted to do in my career. And I ended up eventually landing at this in the series development department at MTV, where I just fell in love with the blend of creativity and business. You're essentially a VC for a network. So you get to see a lot of cool ideas. And when I was an intern there, I, my job was to make VHS copies for all the executives. And um, one day a pilot came in from a bunch of skater guys calling themselves jackasses. And that was the beginning of my career working on the first two seasons of Jackass in the first movie. Can you give us one or two lessons that you have picked up on that you could pay it forward to other people about how to manage just true intense levels of stress? I do a couple of things. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. The first thing I do is I really try to stay balanced and grounded. So I am pretty fanatical about sleep, which made having young children extraordinarily hard for me. Now they sleep. That was tough. I operate best on a compounding effect of eight hours for my lifetime of sleep every night. The second thing I do is I just, I compartmentalize, and I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I compartmentalize. So whether that's time blocking to get things done. I color code my calendar to see where I'm spending my time any given week. I sometimes compartmentalize feelings and I have delayed reactions to things because I've put them in a box on a shelf with a really pretty bow. And I do think that that's a coping mechanism that I probably, again, it has its like downsides, but it re- it's really helpful in a crisis and during really stressful times. And then the third thing I do is I bring levity to almost everything in my life. And I went to Jennifer Auker's Stanford Business School class called Humor, Colon, Serious Business. And it blew my mind. It was incredible to see something that I've taken for granted in my own life because it's just something that I I think I use as a coping mechanism, really be conceptualized and just very intentional. And my husband and I, I mean, there is pretty much nothing that we've ever gone through or that exists on this planet that we cannot find humor in. Well, on the note of humor, um, you work with your husband. You have now for, what, almost 20 years. Can you just give us, like, what makes it work for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we started Eventbrite together, we were just engaged. And I was going to move up to the Bay Area where I'm from. Our family is within 20 minutes, uh, the entire family. I was sort of very burned out and from Hollywood. So I was really excited to to come up here and see what was going on. And I almost joined a startup in the cable network space. And 
they really lowballed me in terms of their initial offer. And Kevin saw that as his opportunity to pounce and give me a counter offer, which was to not take an offer from a startup that undervalued my contribution, but go build something with him and make no money and put all of our savings into bootstrapping the company. <laughs> and I, I think that probably love like made me black. Usually when he's pitching something like this, I can't remember the moment in which I agree, but he is a incredible serial entrepreneur who is missing that chip in his brain that says this might not work out. And I'm an operator. I'm always looking around the corner. He really got me. I had no great retort to it. And we started working on Eventbrite together. At that point, there weren't a lot of great examples. And we had one, exactly one couple that we looked to for advice, which was Michael and Sochi Birch. And they said, kind of offhandedly, they said, divide and conquer, never work on the same thing at the same time. And we really took that one to the bank. That was our founding principle as a couple, which was literally never work on the same thing at the same time, never be working on the same spreadsheet, never be working on the same model, on the same creative idea. It was just brilliant. It was so simple. And that was really, for us, the thing that helped us get from A to Z two times faster because we have complementary skill sets. So we really try to stay out of each other's kitchen in a really respectful way. The second thing that really helped us is that we have an immense amount of, of respect for one another. Julia, I'm going to move to the quick fire round. I'm going to ask you a question. First thing that comes to your mind, there's no right or wrong answer. What is a book that has impacted your life in a material way? I love CEO Excellence by Carolyn Dewar and the team over at McKinsey. And it's like a Bible that I refer back to when I'm feeling sort of aimless or overwhelmed in this role. And fictional, uh, The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. Oh, she's such an exceptional futurist. A quote that you love or live by. So the quote I live by is, she who lasts the longest wins, because I think resilience and fortitude and the just keep goingness is actually something that people undermine and it really matters Agreed. in any pursuit. My most favorite recent quote, comparison is the thief of joy. What is your biggest pinch me moment to date of Eventbrite? Literally every time someone says that they know the company and that they've used the product and it never gets old. A favorite interview question, if you're really trying to get to the core of who somebody is, to decide if you want to be and work with them. What do you ask? I like to ask what scares you. I think it tells a lot about someone, about how they handle maybe a question that comes out of left field that they're not maybe expecting. It tells you a lot about a person, how they approach scary things. Um, it tells you about their personality. It's a moment of vulnerability. And I think that's a really important part of being successful at Eventbrite in particular. We're a very people-centric company. And so, you know, if you're going to be closed off and sort of very corporate-y, it's just ain't going to be your place. We roll up our sleeves and like we lean into one another. Last question. Is there something like a, it can be anything that you kind of hold as sacred? You know, honestly, for me, it's humility. I think that all of this isn't worth it if you lose touch with gratitude and humility. And, you know, in a world where still to this day, as a woman leader, I find myself falling into the trap of trying to be more masculine, trying to be more aggressive, trying to ha actually have a bigger ego. I just keep coming back to the center of what is worth doing and how is it worth doing? And I want to achieve greatness. I want to build a multi-billion dollar company that has sustainable growth for years to come, that enables people to gather all over the world and connect with things that give them joy, that give them purpose, that help them learn something. There's nothing that replaces in-person connection. And I think that I can lead a company that does this at an unprecedented scale, but I'm not willing to lose myself in that. I'm not willing to lose the sense of groundedness of who I am, of where I've come from, of who I'm grateful for. And my motto is always be improving. So I think you have to start from a point of humility in order to always think about what you could be doing better. Julia, I could have you on for hours. I like 
Can't wait till I get to sit next to you solo and ask you 400 more questions. Um, everybody out there, if you haven't already checked out Eventbrite, please God do. Head to eventbrite.com. And Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. We're rooting for you. And everybody, you can join us next week for the Founders Project with Alex von Tobel. Julia, you're just a vision. It's so fun. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. 